Good day, everybody. Zach here with Revzilla, and welcome to another episode of Daily Rider. Our guest today has on its fancy pants. That is a BMW M1000R. It has a one liter engine that makes 200 horsepower. It's all covered in glittery bits of exotic materials, and it costs $27,000, which if you're new here is a lot for a motorcycle. It's basically all of your juvenile adolescent dreams of speed come to life. It's all covered in aluminum and carbon fiber and it's sophisticated and complicated and it is wicked fast. And for all of those reasons, maybe, people often assume that it's also uncomfortable and unruly and unadvisable for commuting to work. So today on The Daily Ride, we will talk about the M1000R's capabilities at full lean and full chat on a racing track, but we'll also talk about, you know, how it works to get to work and hopefully not get arrested. Wish me luck, everybody. <laughs> All right, everybody, BMW's M1000 single R. Before we get going on this daily ride, a quick reminder that this video is sponsored by none other than Revzilla, the YouTube channel that you are watching. Revzilla is an e-commerce company that makes money selling parts and accessories for motorcycles and people who love them. We make these videos, Daily Rider, The Shop Manual, High Side, Low Side Podcast, and CTXP Adventures in the hopes that it'll make motorcycling a more inclusive and welcoming place. So if you feel that way, just keep RevZill in mind next time you need something for you or your bike. And in the meantime, thanks for watching. All right. The M1000 single R, not to be confused with the double R. That's why I made that delineation. The M1000RR is, of course, the sport bike version, which has a full fairing uh, and whatnot, but there are a lot of similarities between the two. We'll start at the engine here. This is a 999cc inline four. It is um, sort of foundationally and structurally very, very similar to lots of other inline four engines that have been produced over the years by BMW and other brands. This one does have a little bit of extra spice and uh, interesting technology mixed into it. The most notable of those technologies is shift cam technology, which is basically BMW's version of variable valve timing. So as the engine uh, revolutions rise, the timing of the valve train changes to accentuate the bike's uh, you know, capabilities and make more power down low and up top in the revs. It's all very confusing and interesting, and I've written a lovely article about this motorcycle, the link of which is in the description of this video, so you can read more about it there. The point is, the engine is wicked fast. We'll talk about that later on some more. Uh, the chassis is fairly basic. It's a twin spar frame. It's a basic trendy upside down swing arm that's nice and long. It has a trellis subframe that is removable, which is nice. It has big stonking brakes. These are badged M calipers uh, with steel braided lines. They are made by Nissan. And one of the other fancy things about this bike, I'll try and get up close so that you can see it, is carbon fiber wheels that are a little bit dirty because I rode this bike in the rain. Just trying to be diligent with my testing. Uh, but carbon fiber wheels are a very exotic and fancy part to have on your motorcycle. And you can see these discs are all chawed up and blued from my time on the racing track. Another notable thing about the M1000 single R is these winglets, which are not carbon fiber, interestingly. They provide some amount of downforce. I forget the exact number as you go particularly fast, <laughs> hopefully not on the street. Lots of other things on the bike are carbon fiber though. The, um, the front fender, the shrouds around the tank, these pieces of bodywork, the rear hugger, um, these little um, ankle guards near the foot peg. It is a bike that is comprehensively sprinkled with carbon fiber bits, as well as this titanium exhaust from Akrapovich, or Akrapovich, or Akrapovich. I don't know how to say it. And yeah, you'll notice the bike is a little bit dirty from when I rode it in the rain, and you'll notice the tires are a little bit uh, goobed up from when I rode it on the track. Which is to say, I feel confident that I'll be able to give you a good snapshot of this motorcycle as we ride it. And I'm not sure what else to say, except I think we should hit the road, you know? So we will fire up this six and a half inch TFT, I believe, um, which is a fairly standard piece of equipment in BMW's lineup here. You'll notice this uh, bar tachometer and stuff we'll talk about later. And we'll fire up this uh, very spicy engine. <laughs> Yeah, da, 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 da. Sounds like an inline four, basically, but there's a lot going on in there. There's the variable valves. There's the valves are titanium and the stems are hollow. There's a lot. Other quick things to note is that there's a cowl on the back here, no passenger seat. 
So I will be talking about passenger accommodations when I had the passenger seat on, but since I came from the racetrack recently, I had the cowl on there and the foot peg was removed for track use as well. Enough of that jibber jabber, right? Let's, uh, let's hit the road to the office and see if we can, oh, it's got a hill hold. <laughs> so you pump the brake lever once and you get a little hill hold thing here and uh, it won't roll. And you pump the lever again and I mostly do it by accident, but I do think it's a nifty feature if you're into that kind of thing. Okie dokie. Let's ride to work everybody. Right off the bat, you'll notice that the red line shown on the dash right now is 10,000 RPM. If you keep an eye on that, you'll notice that it will continue to rise as we ride. It's a dynamic red line that BMW uses on all its bikes, or all its bikes that use this dash anyway, as far as I know. Um, and uh, I think it's kind of a cool feature, especially with a, a sort of high strung, high performance engine like this. When you first start the bike up, it red lines at 6,000 or 8,000, and then it slowly climbs up to its maximum listed red line of 14,600 RPM. But before we get too distracted talking about those kind of specs, we should talk about actual specs. The most important of which are that uh, base price of right around $27,000. Might be just a little bit more for 2024. As usual, all this information is listed in the description of the video. It has a 33.1 inch seat height, I believe. And when the tank was full of 4.3 gallons, it weighed in on the Daily Rider scales at 443 pounds, which is, um, you know, a full-size motorcycle, but pretty, pretty light for a bike that makes 205 claimed horsepower at 13 and a half thousand RPM, which is just a staggering number. You're going to get a little bit less at the rear wheel as dyno charts on the internet will show you, but it's still just a fantastic amount of power <laughs> and yeah really not a lot of weight i mean it's only a little bit heavier than a yamaha mt09 i think and makes i don't know nearly double the horsepower and an mt09 is not a slow bike hopefully that gives you some context to the spec sheet <laughs> as for how it feels to sit on and ride i implied in the introduction to this video that people often assume it is uncomfortable i got a lot of comments on social media about how uh, why would you ever ride this bike to work? It's so uncomfortable. And um, I just have to say that it's not. The seat height is a little tall and that's notable, but it's not ridiculous. And once you're on the seat, the seat is quite comfortable. There's a decent enough amount of leg room, I think. Plus the foot pegs on this bike are adjustable up and down a little bit. And the flat handlebar seems really, really flat. Like there's no rise in the bar basically, um, but it's in a really reasonable position. Um, and I feel, very compelled to say that I had a lot of different people test this bike, my colleagues, even my 70 year old father swung a leg over at one point and I assumed he would just immediately complain about how uncomfortable it was but the first thing he said was oh it's pretty good it was pretty reasonable and everyone said that everyone on staff and everyone that I've ever heard who's tried this bike has said the same thing let's merge out onto this here highway and there really isn't a world in which you can use all the power on tap. <laughs> Before I talk about the other things that BMW failed to perfect when it comes to this bike on the highway, we should address the engine right off the bat because there are a couple things to discuss. One, if you read harsh criticisms of this engine, you'll see that people complain often about the amount of torque or power, thrust, whatever, available between about 6,000 and about 8,000 RPM. And if you're wondering how I feel about that, those complaints are perfectly valid. Any dyno chart of this bike will show a pretty significant dip in power and torque when the engine is at those revs. And it's only fair to say that the main reason that it feels like not very much power, not very much torque is because everywhere else in the rev band provides such ridiculous power that it does feel like a big hole, a big dip in the available power. That has to do with noise emissions regulations in the United States. And one of the ways that BMW addressed this was offering a torque rich map from the factory. So this bike is a sort of standard map. It revs to 14,600 RPM. And therefore the noise emissions regulations tested by the US government 
test the noise of the engine at 7,300 RPM. With the engine map that prioritizes torque for this bike that you can get again from the dealership or factory, the maximum revs are, uh oh, I'm forgetting, 12,600 maybe? I'll put it on screen. At any rate, that means the noise regulation testing is done at half of that RPM, which allows BMW to create a little bit more noise and therefore a little bit more power right in the middle of the rev band. That torque map is something that I tried and I tested extensively both on the track and off. We'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it is pretty notable and massive piece of effort that BMW put into addressing some of the concerns about navigating around regulations that certain governments around the world will place on performance vehicles like this one. All that is to say, when you use this engine between 6,000 and 8,000 RPM, you will notice a little bit of a hole before it totally comes alive, <laughs> as you can see. And when it comes alive, boy, does it come alive. And the torque bike does not do that. It's very linear. And I'll talk more about why you should get that one later. <laughs> as for general manners on the open road, we're finally getting to that now. The few things I don't like are the vibes in the handlebar, which are pretty prominent at cruising speed. And I think if you rode this thing all day, you might have a little bit of a weird tingle in your hands and fingers from the vibes. You could probably put some weighted bar ends on the end here, try to help that. I don't really know if you're interested. It's something that I might try if I own the bike. Also at cruising RPM, the mirrors are very bad. These sort of sexy bar end mirrors. And it basically looks like a action scene from a Japanese cartoon. Everything's blurry. You don't know what's going on. It seems like an odd miss for a company like BMW, which is usually so good at that kind of thing. Also, outright fuel range is not particularly good because the average fuel number, son of a gun, I'm forgetting what the actual average was, but I think it was high 30s uh, or maybe yeah, mid to high 30s. And it's a four gallon tank, so you're not gonna go very far before you need to get fuel. It's gonna be around or just over 100 miles when the fuel light comes on. And you're gonna go probably 120, 130 miles before you need fuel. And that kind of understates how comfortable this bike is to ride along the highway, to be honest. Aside from the slightly tight legroom and the fuzzy hand grips, it's really reasonable. I think the seat is surprisingly good. It allows you to move forward and back a little bit and you lean into the wind and considering the structure and the intent of what this bike is, I think it's pretty darn good actually. Uh, one fun little piece of information that I tripped over when I was testing this bike was I didn't actually do a full-on fuel calculation when I rode the bike at the track, but I did allow the computer to uh, track it as it always does and see what the calculated fuel mileage was when I rode on the track. And it was somewhere between 17 and 19 miles per gallon. So if you're riding around the track and you're opening the throttle a lot, as usual, you can expect your, your fuel range to go down quite a bit. <laughs> And I suppose that's fair. All right, a red light. This is our sort of um, drag racing red light. Not that I would ever say anything like that. Uh, when this thing goes green, we can, uh, we can light the fuse just a little bit and see what happens in first gear anyway. <laughs> in case you missed that, in road mode, which is one of the most docile road modes aside from rain, we accelerated and when it was at maybe two or 3,000 RPM, it picked the front wheel up and then the wheelie control held the front wheel a few inches off the ground all the way to whenever I let off the throttle at 70 miles an hour or something. And this bike will do that on a racetrack basically through third and fourth gear up to about 140 miles an hour. The front wheel will be floating off the ground and wheelie control will be working. It is maniacally fast, just super, super impressive. And it's very hard to justify or ever even come close to suggesting that someone would tap into that power on the street, frankly. <laughs> Despite having just completely arm stretching, absurd power on tap, the M1000R is also pretty good at this. Like we're going, this is, we're idle in second gear and it's just chugging along at nine miles an hour. And when you pick up the throttle, it's nice and smooth, it's easy. There's a little bit of drive line lash when you go on off throttle in the chain and, and cush drive, but it's pretty good. And it's just remarkably docile and easy and calm and collected and composed at speeds like this, considering the just sort of like 
vicious otherworldly power that it can unleash when you ask it to. Back to the mirrors really quick here. One thing I find so interesting is that cruising speed 5,500, 6,000 RPM, the uh, mirrors are quite blurry. But if you go down, like, let's just go down to first gear out on the highway here, and you go, oh, that's maybe too much. So you go 8,000 RPM, second gear, 65 miles an hour. The mirrors start to clear up a little bit. Actually, maybe even more at like 9,000 RPM. <laughs> They're surprisingly clear at that RPM, which is a silly test to do and it doesn't really matter. But I just think it's an interesting kind of like allegory for the bike. The bike wants to be above eight or 9,000 RPM. That's where it kind of wants to live. That's where everything begins. <laughs> is it silly to have that capability kind of like locked away so high in the rev band on a street bike? Maybe, but you know, this is how performance vehicles work in this day and age. I don't make the rules. All right, well, we already started talking about uh, city manners a little bit when we were stuck in that traffic, but we can finish the conversation here, um, which goes something like this. It's a pretty, it's a pretty reasonable machine in these scenarios. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a little top heavy, which a couple of my colleagues and testers pointed out as well. It's not heavy in general, but the weight is propped up, right? Because it needs to lean over really far. So it's, a, it's, it's taller than um, maybe than you might expect, or it feels a little taller than you might, than you might expect. Um, but uh, it is amazingly composed. I just think the fueling is excellent. I think the clutch feel is excellent. Um, basic cable clutch, it's nothing fancy. The delicate, and precise nature of the controls allow the rider to feel especially connected to the bike. And does that help when you're going 100 miles an hour through a corner at a racetrack? Yeah, but does it also help here? It does, I think. Ugh. I think it does. I think the, the reason that the, the bar vibrates on the highway is that it's not rubber mounted. There isn't too much sort of like insulation keeping you away from the feel of the bike, which on the highway is a bad thing but around town and in performance situations is a good thing. Let's see if we can get a nice clean full stop. Uh, not clean, but we did it, we did it. As we approach the stoplight, I'm gonna talk about the dash a little bit. The dash is very complex and deep. I'll do a fair amount of talking about it on this ride. Oh, there we go, we got the hill hold. I don't have to use the brake to talk about the dash. Thanks, BMW. You'll notice up here, the range says 96 miles. You might see that start going up because the last time I rode this bike through a full tank was on the racetrack. And therefore, uh, the computer thinks, okay, well, if you're gonna get 18 to 20 miles to the gallon, then you're not gonna be able to go very far. But because we are on the, on the daily ride and we're get, probably getting somewhere in the 30s, this is gonna start to go up. Those parameters are adjustable in the settings of the dash and uh, with this upper menu button here, you can cycle through um, total mileage and uh, fuel gauge trip meters. Oh boy, the hill hold really got me. I was singing its praises and then it got me. I guess Ryan Fortnine was right. Anyway, that upper parameter of data that can be showed um, offers lots and lots of different options, uh, too many in my opinion, um, but uh, you can tune it all in the dash, which is kind of nice. And I like keeping it on range or fuel gauge because I think that makes the most sense. I would say that the M1000R is in some ways a waste of potential to ride around in environments like this, pretty obviously. But like, do you feel cool? While you do it, that's up to you. Uh, or do you feel a little bit silly? <laughs> As uh, one of the uh, commenters and question askers on Instagram proposed. I don't know, that's, that's really up to you. I, I tend to feel cool because I like sort of knowing that the bike I'm riding has all this potential, but uh, maybe that makes me a, a crummy, vain person. I'm not sure, again, that's for you to decide. All right, Lover's Lane. And we can talk about how your lover might feel on the back of this machine. And the answer is probably somewhere where you think it is. Not very comfortable. The thing that I think is interesting is that 
oftentimes on Daily Rider, I say, you know, the passenger accommodations are about as comfortable as the rider accommodations. In other words, on a Goldwing, very comfortable. And on an R6, not very comfortable in either case. In this case, I think the rider's accommodations are actually pretty comfortable. Like I said, I don't think it's that bad. The passenger accommodations, on the other hand, are pretty Spartan. The foam in the seat is nice, but it's narrow, according to uh, my lovely lady friend. And she said basically across town is as far as she'd want to go. Not the worst leg room, uh, not the worst seat she's ever felt, but perched way up high, not a lot to sit on, not a lot to hold on to. Um, and uh, so, you know, there you have it. Doke into the twisty road section here, and uh, there really aren't enough good words that I can use to describe how the M1000R handles a set of corners. It is ridiculously capable. It's very, very impressive. And I'll start with some of the basics. The suspension is firm. It does a good job transmitting all the things, all the pieces of the road that you need to feel. It is a little bit uncompromising when it comes to really bumpy roads or sharp potholes or whatever but it's it's firm in just the right way for a bike like this as far as i'm concerned and of course it's uh, dynamically adjustable in certain modes and it is manually adjustable in other modes the balance of the chassis is also really really good it has a pretty steep steering head angle meaning it's bound to be quick to turn and i think those carbon fiber wheels actually do quite a bit to reduce the energy that a wheel usually holds in, in making it difficult to change direction because it is fantastically light to the touch. It's just almost telepathic the way it dives into corners. It wants to lean over. That huge 200 section rear tire does not seem to kind of bind the bike up a little bit in casual street riding situations in a way that other sport bikes often suffer from. It doesn't stand alone in this category of ultra sharp, light to the touch and capable sport bikes, but it is probably near the top of the list when talking about bikes that mix fierce performance with really impressive and confidence inspiring agility. Again, to give a sort of wider breadth of context, I took the bike to Chakwala Valley Raceway, a local racetrack here in Southern California, and I rode around as fast as I darn well could on street tires anyway. And if anything, the tires were the limitation. I just thought, man, if I put race tires on this bike, I could go way faster and that is saying a lot for a motorcycle these days because modern hypersport street tires are pretty darn good and when i ride it on a road like this or when any of the other testers and colleagues and friends tried this bike they said exactly the same thing which is that it's just so easy it's just so easy to ride it is amazingly capable on the side of the tire with an advanced track rider on board but it is also just friendly and willing and easy to use, which is just the ultimate compliment that you can pay a sport bike, in my opinion. Righty, back on to surface streets here. <laughs> and actually on the topic of suspension, I'm gonna switch from road mode through dynamic mode to race mode, because I believe the settings and basic parameters for the electronics in rain, road, and dynamic are to have dynamic suspension adjustment. In other words, the damping in the fork and the shock are constantly adjusting. And in race mode, it locks in one specific set of damping parameters, and I can feel it already. <laughs> it is much more harsh and much more direct in this mode. All right, red light, let's talk about brakes. We're gonna jump on the brakes here. <laughs> uh, the ABS settings on this bike are fairly vast, just like all the other electric parameters, <laughs> electronic parameters, excuse me. Um, and yeah, one of the things it does is it offers availability in sort of an ABS Pro setting to carry the back wheel just a couple inches off the ground, which I experimented with on the racetrack. It's almost similar to Ducati's uh, slide-by brake system that they've had on the Hyper 950 and Hyper 698 Mono. It allows a lot of sort of leeway and sort of wayward movement from the bike's chassis in a way that advanced riders will really appreciate, I think. And in general, no surprise, those big Nissan calipers and braided lines and big discs are just fantastic. Lots of progressive feel, lots of power, exactly what you want from brakes. I absolutely love them. Right, yet another red light, and we're gonna need a humdinger 
of a red light to talk about all the features in the dash on this bike, I gotta say. Uh, but let's give it a whirl, shall we? <laughs> uh, if you hold down on this menu button right here, um, we'll go down into, uh, oh, excuse me, you can just tap it. And then you go down into this uh, set of menus here. Uh, settings, this main settings menu is where you will find um, vehicle settings, um, ride mode pre-selection, which for some reason you can only select a few of the ride modes. There are three different race pro modes, as well as rain, road, dynamic, and race. Um, why you can only select some of them, I'm not sure. Um, there are tons and tons of settings in here. The other thing I'd like to show uh, using this little wheel guy here is the uh, trip meter stuff, which is very complex and and uh, I don't know, just like lots and lots of information. It's very BMW. You have to dig all the way down here to reset your trip meter, which I think is annoying. I don't know why you can't do it from the main dash. Uh, and then the last thing is this sport screen, um, which is kind of cool. Um, I use this on the track and it just makes for a sort of a larger um, analog tachometer and uh, shows brake pressure and track control settings and max lean angle and stuff like that. It is a vast and impressive dashboard, no doubt. If I have one complaint, it's that you just have to dig a little too deep to get to some of the settings that you want to access on a regular basis. And a green light, just like that. Time to go, everybody. Okie dokie. So sometimes around this time, we ask the question, would you buy this motorcycle just for the engine? And in the case of the M1000 single R, drum roll, please. No, I don't think so. I would not. If you are really into inline four, power plants, if you really just love the sound and the feel and the tradition or the <laughs> pedigree or something, then yeah, this one is kind of special. It's very, very potent and it has really interesting technology and and all of that is valuable and interesting, no doubt. Um, but would I choose this engine over uh, a KTM V-Twin or an Aprilia V4 or even a Ducati V4? I don't think so, right? I don't think so. Yeah. Chicksa bro, do a wheelie. One other thing I feel compelled to mention as the radiator fan was running at that stoplight is the engine heat. I've been riding this bike around in winter time in Los Angeles here, which is not particularly cold, but it is cool and reasonable and I have not ridden it in the heat. And I think that any bike that makes a lot of power is gonna make a lot of heat. It's worth noting that you live in a hot, humid place and that's where you're gonna ride. You probably are gonna notice a little bit of heat wafting on you, though BMW in general is typically quite good at uh, curtailing that kind, of, um, that kind of thing in their bikes. <laughs> so back to the question at the beginning of the episode about how the bike works as a commuter, you can probably tell that my feeling is like surprisingly good. And then back to the issue of the two different engine maps and that sort of torque rich map that you can get from the factory. I'd like to tie those two things together by saying, I think if you've not ridden this bike, you would be amazed at how comfortable and reasonable and good it is to ride around town or ride through the canyons or something like that. And that being the case, I just have to recommend that any buyer of an M1000 single R gets that other map installed. It's free from the factory. If a dealer does it for you, I think they're probably charging an hourly rate. I'm not really sure. Um, but the point is you still have access to so much of what makes this bike special, which is the chassis, the, the way it handles, the brakes, the electronics. It's, it's, a, really, it's a really cool and sophisticated awesome awe-inspiring motorcycle and if you cut down the maximum revs and you cut down your maximum horsepower from a claimed 205 to a claimed 180 are you going to take a bit of a hit to your ego yeah maybe i can appreciate that you might feel like oh man there's no way i'm going to get that bike and not have all the horsepower on tap but the truth is the the torque rich map is the one that that makes the most sense for a bike like this because it is so BMW because the cruise control works so well because I've had heated grips on this whole time because the seat is actually comfortable for some reason it's a weird thing for a performance oriented rider such as myself to say I think you should get the one with the less HPs <laughs> but it's the truth it's the truth everybody
Okay, well, let's slatter this $27,000 track spec BMW with mud, shall we? That'll make everybody happy, won't it? Oh my God, it's worse than I thought. What are, what, what are we, I don't want to be like a total wino about this, but what are we learning exactly? <sighs> okay, what are we doing here? We're gonna, are we gonna go to rain mode? No, we don't need rain mode. We'll just go back to road. <laughs> oh, and then we can mess around with race pro two, which will offer this uh, traction control setting on the fly. So you see I have a DTC switch here, um, and this allows you to change traction control as you ride, which is kind of cool. Uh, I think it allows you to go plus seven and minus seven maybe. So that's something we can goof around with. And then ABS. But we'll start in road mode. And I, uh, I'm so sorry, M1000, that I'm treating you so poorly. We'll also find out how these uh, Bridgestone RS11 Hypersport tires handle with a thin layer of mud. And I think maybe it's gonna be not very good. Not bad on the rocks, surprisingly reasonable. Uh, it's actually a good suspension test to some extent. We're in the road. Let's go. Actually, oh god. Let's go to race, and we'll get that locked suspension mode. Oh yeah, a little bit less. There's definitely more compression damping. Uh, if you're upset that I'm not uh, riding it in the mud more, I do apologize. But it's a little. It's a little sketchy. <laughs> Foot off the peg. Very professional, Zach. Woo! So race trash control. Let's try that in the sand here. Pretty aggressive. Let's try race pro. At zero. <laughs> it's pretty good. Let's try it at minus six. <laughs> Not a lot of difference in the mud. But I can tell you that at full speed on the track, it definitely felt a little bit different. I need a minute. I know, I know, I don't want to be too dramatic, but it's a, it's a, it's a little, it's a little bit scary, you guys. I didn't love it. Um, okay, so now we find out if this thing can do a wheelie. Obviously, it can do a wheelie. I almost feel silly and juvenile even doing it right here. It'll do a wheelie at 150 miles an hour if you want it to. Um, but I do think that it's important to keep in mind that even though this engine has a reputation for and genuinely does make most of its power up high in the revs, because it makes so much, because it, the BMW claims 205 horsepower out of this engine, which is berserk, same engine as is in the S1000 RR, because of that, it's easy to overlook the torque numbers and be like, well, it's just like not that impressive and it's not that good. But in first or second gear, it'll hook up a wheelie way down low, down lower than it really has any business doing because it is a surprisingly dynamic engine. And I think it's worth calling that out. <laughs> Alrighty, so can you back it in? You bet you can. <laughs> juicy, very juicy. Oh, look out, semi truck in the way here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the um, the back and in antics are very good on this bike. Mostly because it's just so flipping. <laughs> it's just amazing how sort of light and dynamic it feels. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific, I gotta say. Oh, hey, there's cone, some cones out for our... Uh, U-turn test. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, those cones are not there for us, but you know, this will work. Three parking spaces. I think the turning radius on this bike is uh, surprisingly reasonable. I'm gonna go on this way. Surprisingly reasonable for what it is. So full lock, feet up. Uh, yeah, two point, what was that? 2.2 parking spaces maybe? That's fair. Not, not as good as uh, a lot of street bikes we've been testing lately, but it's also significantly higher performance, so I think we can cut it just a little bit of slack. Wow. Hey, daily riders, we made it to the office. We did not get arrested yet. Oh, my heckin' heck. Look at that. Goodness gracious. Oh, my God. I think I've washed this thing ASAP. Um, okay. Well, I guess we obeyed the rules just enough to 
to stay safe today, um, and I know what I'm doing this afternoon. Let's take one more listen to this mighty, mighty engine, shall we? Yeah, what do you think about that? Does that sound like a little bit of performance? It is. <laughs> Okie dokie, everybody. We got Instagram questions lined up here on this M1000 Single R. And I'd like to start with one from 1930 Matt, who says it is $27,000-ish. <laughs> Out the door knocking on 30 grand. This is a bike priced for buyers who will likely be older, but is ride too aggressive to fit their, let's say, broken in back and knees? <laughs> so this is a good question. I think it's sort of like making some assumptions that the person to buy this would be um, older and less tolerant of things that are comfortable. And I think that BMW saw that coming and that's why it's so comfortable for what it is. I think that it's amazingly good in that respect. I really want to drive that point home. It's not a sport touring bike. It's not as comfortable as a, a GS or something, but it is remarkably good for what it is and I won't have any more talk about how it's uncomfortable and unreasonable from that perspective. Next question is from 4E6 who says, tell me how extremely useful the wings are on a daily rider, please. <laughs> uh, here they are. They are not made of carbon fiber and I think that's so that they're not damaged as easily. To answer your question, they're useless. They're not going to do anything for you on a daily ride. They're barely going to do anything for you on a racetrack. We've survived this long without wings. We don't need them now. Next question is from It's Gene Parmesan, who says, is this caliber of bike even that much fun on the street? When redlining a first gear sends you straight to jail right away, is it actually that rewarding to ride such a fast bike slow? Yeah, to some extent, you're right. It's wicked fast. You can mitigate some of that with that torque spec engine map that I talked about, which makes it much more broad and linear power. But ultimately, it's a very, very fast motorcycle, and your question is valid. The thing I would like to point out is that it is such an extremely good motorcycle to ride aside from how much horsepower it makes. If it made 50 horsepower or 100 horsepower, whatever, it would still be amazing to go through a set of curves because it's so cohesive. The whole thing works so well together. The brakes are great. The suspension is good. It's so just easy to lean and direct and communicative and good. It's so good. If you rip the engines out and coast race down a hill, this versus any other, you know, naked bike, MT09 to KTM Duke to an Aprilia Tuono, whatever. I think that this bike would be surprisingly good in that situation. Next question is from Logan H43, who says, does it feel more Japanese practical, Austrian manic, or Italian sophisticated? Love this question. And you might not agree with Logan H43's categorization of different countries and what they bring to the motorcycling table. But it is a good question of how you blend all those things, right? Because it's an inline four engine, which is a Japanese kind of thing, but it's also very kind of fancy and sophisticated like Italian bikes often are. And it's got that little whiff of ridiculousness. I think on the M1000 single R website at BMW.com, it says a dash of insanity. A dash of insanity is how BMW couches its own motorcycle. So it knows that th this bike is way out there. And to answer your question, Logan, I think it's a really excellent blend of all things. I think it's BMW flexing all of the right muscles and showing off its best side here, because even if I don't think the inline four engine is as characterful and interesting personally, it is undeniably capable. And all of the other blends of comfort and comfort features with the capability and performance aspect of this bike, it's a phenomenal package. It's really, really good. And it's a good blend of all those things. And I think that's a great question. Next question is from Stuart Jeff 75 who says, how does it handle compared to the S1000XR for everyday use, right? So the XR is the sort of sport touring version, which has a screen and stuff like that. I haven't ridden an XR in a few years. My sense is that that's what I would get. If I had to pick one, I would get an XR because it, yeah, it's going to be more comfortable. And the XR is actually a misunderstood bike because people think that it's kind of a little bit more comfortable and sport touring oriented than it is. It is quite vicious itself. And I bet you could shred a track day on that bike also, <laughs> though I have not ridden the new generation XR on a racetrack. I feel confident that it would be surprisingly potent. And yeah, that's probably the one I would choose if I'm being honest, though I didn't do a back-to-back -back test. Last question is uh, an allegorical one. As you guys know, I like this. This one comes in from dpr 8 dpr -er. Anyway, uh, this person asks, which In-N-Out menu item is this? If you're not familiar with In-N-Out, it is a fast food hamburger joint here in California on the West Coast of the United States, and people love it. You can just get burgers and fries and shakes, and that's basically, I don't think there's anything else on the menu, is there? Anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, what is the order? This, to me, is a double-double cheeseburger, maybe even a three-by-three or a four-by-four, four, with fries, animal style, and a chocolate shake. In other words, 
This is all of the things that BMW can produce. It's basically the full might of the menu thrown at this type of meal. Can you just taste it? Can you just have half the burger and half the fries and half the shake? Yeah, you can. You won't get the full caloric punishment <laughs> that way. In other words, if you want to experience this bike in its fullest, if you want to experience in and out burgers and fries animal style and a milkshake in its fullest form, you gotta finish the whole thing. And if you're gonna do that, you need to be prepared and you will be affected physiologically <laughs> by that meal. It's, it's a lot of food, it's a lot of flavor, it's a lot of everything. And that's what this bike is, it is a lot. It's sort of gaudy and loud visually. Um, it's literally loud when you spin it up. It's incredibly capable. It's very expensive, which is actually completely separate from the in and out analogy. But um, the point is, if you want to experience this thing in its full form, you got to be ready. You might even have to prepare the day before. Okie doke. That's all I've got for Instagram questions. Thank you so much as usual for submitting them. Let's jump inside and put it on the Daily Rider leaderboard. See how it does, shall we? Oh, you know, team, thank you again for all those Instagram questions. Some really, really good ones in there. It's super helpful to know what you want to know. And uh, I just, I love it. I have, we have fun with it. I hope you have fun with it. <laughs> Before we get to rating this M1000 single R on the Daily Rider leaderboard, I would like to just reiterate a couple of things. One, the article that I have written, link in description, um, does include stuff like what RPM the valves change their attitude, 9,000. When the velocity stacks and the intake uh, change their length, 11,000 RPM. What else? Uh, other things too. The point is, I went into much more detail in the written article. The videos are fun. I know um, that it's nice to get all the information possible, but there's stuff I definitely missed with this bike because it is so complex and dense. I tried to put all that stuff in the article and I hope that um, you'll read it. Okay, on to the task at hand. Um, the M1000 single R on the Daily Rider leaderboard. What do we think here? We, so the, where we're at with the list here, V100 Mandelo on top of the heap with the Kawasaki Z900 SE and the Triumph Scrambler 1200X ringing out the podium. I think that the M1000 single R, while it is an incredible performance tour de force, I don't think it's as good as a V100 Mandelo to get to work. I think the Mandelo is, um, a little bit more reasonable, a little bit more comfortable. Uh, it's heavier and the seat isn't as good, but this is in the context of, of, a, of an all-rounder, of a, of a sort of like naked sport touring bike, <laughs> the Mandelo, not a high performance bike like the M1000. Um, the Z900, same thing. Is it better? I don't know. Scrambler 1200? <laughs> I'm gonna pick up the magnet, that usually helps. Uh, let's go in here. It's going here, second on the board. I don't think I can rate it above a V100 Mandelo. I just think that bike's too reasonable and, uh, and characterful. Bottom line here, I think a Z900 SE will do most of the things an M1000 does for most riders. But if you wanna rub that uh, lamp and have the genie come out and show you some stuff that you've never seen before, <laughs> that's the lamp, boy, that's the lamp. I hope that you'll read my article. As I said, it contains lots of stuff that I couldn't talk about here today. I hope that um, you enjoyed the ride. I hope you got a kick out of putting the sucker on the board. Thank you again for your questions. I so enjoyed this yet another episode of Daily Rider and I very much hope to see you next time. See everybody.